Um, with each of these tutorials you'll have access to, you can either just follow along and watch, or you can run them as you go. You don't have to run them. Um, if you want to take more time to look through them and run them later, that they'll be like available for you to do that. So um, you can always just sit back and relax and and watch the screen um, to see to watch things go by. So you don't necessarily um, need to keep back keep up with the um, with running it on your own computer. But you're welcome to. Um, to start out, I'm we're gonna have Amy Steiker, who is from NSIDC. She's going to talk us through NASA Earth Data Cloud, which is basically how we can access NASA data um, programmatically from Python really easily and stream it from the cloud, uh, which makes everything a lot faster. So we'll we'll look through data access with um, Earth Access and also IcePix. Um, IcePix is um, for ISAT2 data, um, and Amy will talk about that. That's not a situation in the water bottle. Sorry. Thank you. All right. Great. Oh, you know what? The microphone's in my camera now. I might just put it over to the side. I think it should be all right. Oh, no, no problem. It's all good. Fine. It's fine. All right. Um, thank you all. Thanks for the intro, Tasha. Again, my name is Amy Steiker, uh, and I work at the National Snow and Ice Data Center. I'll give an introduction to that data center in just a minute. I work more broadly on kind of tools and services overall across NASA Earth data, um, particularly in the cloud. So um, let's jump in. I will note there's quite a lot of content. Um, we broke out these tutorials into kind of four, three main parts, kind of four. Um, so there's a lot more material kind of in the um, in these notebooks and files, probably then I'm going to be going over in person today. So don't don't panic too much. I'll probably kind of skip over, but note that there's just a lot of kind of background resources for you, um, for you to go back through. And of course, as Tasha said, like jump in, ask questions. You know, um, I'll make sure uh, that we're not moving too quickly. Um, if you want to follow along in the Cryo Cloud book. Um, and I will also kind of keep an eye on chat as best as I can. Um, this is kind of the section that we're working off of um, under tutorials in the NASA Earth Data Cloud Access. Uh, the, I'm going to start off with more of a presentation, and then we'll jump in, as Tasha mentioned, into um, actually, you know, hands-on working with these Python libraries, in particular Earth Access and IcePix. So um, for now, hang, hang tight as far as working in the cryo cloud um, and then we'll navigate over to the notebooks that we'll be working off of in just a minute um, so i'm going to jump in to um, kind of our first introduction to nasa earth data cloud and isat2 um, and i will note um, i've had some issues with some of the images rendering in the book itself i will get that fixed um, i'm kind of doing a little bit of a hack right now as we walk through um, together live um, as Tasha was navigating, I'm actually in the repository, the GitHub repository, where the book um, sort of lives and where all that code lives, just because GitHub is a nice feature and it renders some of the images a little more cleanly. So um, I'm working on this for now, but again, um, no need to follow along directly with me. This is more of just an overview and presentation. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm going to start off this introduction to kind of broader like NASA Earth Data Cloud and what that means, getting into some cloud computing considerations, and then I'll touch on a little bit of an introduction to the to NASA's ISAT2 mission because we'll be working through some examples of data access using um, some data sets from there. And I wanted to start with kind of some, some concepts and really kind of taking a step back and just talking more broadly about sort of modes of data access. Um, and I think this is a really great diagram um, from uh, Alexei Yushik-Lomanov at the um, NASA Goddard Space Flight Center um, that's kind of describing this migration and this evolution um, when it comes to sort of paradigms to data access. So, you know, sort of in, um, in the past, but also still present, and we'll talk about kind of how modes of cloud computing and also download are still perfectly um, uh, acceptable and, and make sense in various contexts, but kind of on the left, this notion of, you know, sort of going to a particular website where, a date, where data are archived, you know, various um, 
in particular in this diagram, NASA uh, distributed active archive centers or any other sort of data archive. You go to that website, you find the files you need, you download them or sort of move those files you know, out from where they live on some hardware that exists at that data center onto your local computer or some sort of shared um, environment that you may, might be collaborating on uh, at some institution. Um, and, you know, there's, uh, again, there's strong reasons for continuing to, to do that, but some of the sort of issues with that are, first of all, it can be time consuming, right? Um, I'll kind of scroll back up a little bit to the text here, um, but this can be time consuming if the data is large, even with fast internet. Um, there's sort of that copying and sort of losing that reproducibility sometimes in terms of sort of that provenance and sort of where that data originally came from. And if you want to work from data across different domains, you know, you may have to be downloading from different data centers. So there's sort of the shift um, into a combined shared cloud computing environment. This is what we're calling the NASA Earth Data Cloud, where data across these 12 distributed active archive centers are sort of in the same location. And there's this concept of anal what we call analysis in place where um, you don't have to do any of that movement of data. Um, you can be working within that same place where the data live um, and all of the kind of tools to get that data sort of value added visualization or subsetting tools also exist in that same shared location. So just a couple of notes about that, um, you know, that all NASA Earth Science data will continue to be 100% free and open to the public. Um, those existing data services will continue to, to exist and work. Um, and, th and things like on-premise um, high-performance computing, you know, still play an important role. Um, but sort of this shift in where we're going and what will change it's easier for those um, data centers to collaborate and to support like shared kind of cloud services across these data sets. And I would kind of think about this as not a shift away from, because um, again, downloading is still uh, offered and an acceptable form of data access, but we're sort of adding these new capabilities to analyzing data sort of in place. Um, so that's pretty much what I covered um, in all of this text below. I think a really great example of this, you know, that I think we're all familiar with is utilizing like Google Docs or Google Sheets where, you know, that document, unless you're actually exporting it, right, and downloading it to your own computer, um, that's all in the cloud, right? And so all you need is a web browser. Um, you know, if you want to share those documents, you can kind of do that active collaboration. So that's kind of the general overview. Um, so what is, when we talk about NASA Earth Data Cloud, what, what do we mean here? So basically when we, we're talking about NASA's cloud-hosted storage, um, we, we're using this NASA Earth Data Cloud terminology, and we're in this migration period right now. A lot of the data centers, um, several of them now have moved all their data into this cloud environment. Um, others are sort of still in that transition but all, all data will be moved over to the cloud um, over the next few years. Um, I mentioned some terminology for those who aren't familiar, just backing up a little bit. So yeah, there's these 12 data centers um, across NASA Earth Data that are called DACs or Distributed Active Archive Centers. Um, the National Snow and Ice Data Center is one of those. We are part of the larger NSIDC, which is a part of the cooperative, the CU Boulder's Cooperative Institute for Research and Environmental Sciences. And as far as um, the NSIDC DAC itself, um, we now have all ISAT-2 data and ISAT glass from the first ISAT mission. Um, all those products are available in Earth Data Cloud and we're continuing to move our other um, missions and other data sets into the cloud now. So, going to zoom out a little bit further. So I touched on like the sort of NASA st uh, status as far as our cloud migration, um, but zooming out a little bit and just talking about some cloud computing basics, because there's a lot of terminology out there. Um, and again, I know I'm going to be throwing out a ton of concepts. Um, so if you have questions and uh, about any of this, you know, <laughs> jump in and ask. Um, so there's you know, it's sort of a nebulous term, pun intended, um, and Tosh already gave a nice overview of just sort of cloud computing in general. Um, as far as NASA's sort of contract, we are, all our data um, in terms of that migration to Earth Data Cloud are living um, within the Amazon Web Services, AWS, and that data is um, 
sorry, moving uh, people out of the way here and faces. Um, so that data is, is uh, it, it, it's been moving to the AWS Simple Storage uh, ser Service or S3. Um, there's a lot of other services within this AWS kind of ecosystem. So another one is um, this, this term, if you've heard of this before, if you've seen this before, EC2. So that's really, it's, it's an elastic compute uh, cloud and really you can think of it as sort of a remote computer. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about how this all kind of relates back to CryoCloud in just a moment. Um, there's also this concept of different regions. So across the Amazon Web Services, there's a lot of different regions where data are hosted, these like clusters of data centers. So all data in NASA Earth Data Cloud are hosted in this US West 2 region. The reason we're going through all of these concepts, again, because you'll probably see these terms um, as we move forward into these tutorials, um, but also there's an important note kind of about these regions. So if this kind of remote computer as long as that's running in that same region of where the data are, um, then you can really think of this just like you're accessing a file on your own laptop. So just as you know, you have a, a laptop that has compute, um, has storage capabilities as well, it's all kind of interacting in that same space. You can think of it the same way in the cloud. So we're like within that same region, we can have storage, we can have compute, and then that kind of access to the files um, uh, first of all, is free. I'll get into cost uh, in next, but um, you can think of it again as sort of analogous to like working within your own hard drive. So as far as the cryo cloud, um, that's the case. So the cryo cloud that we'll be moving into in a minute, like that is also running in this same region. So as we open up and sort of interact with files from Earth Data Cloud, um, we can do that in a really seamless way and without actually having to do any file movement. Um, we get a lot, you know, there's a lot of questions um, that are completely valid as far as sort of cost considerations. What does this mean as in this sort of paradigm shift? Um, and yeah, again, those are really valid questions that we're working to, um, to help provide support on. So that notion of analysis in place, um, you know, there's a lot of advantages here. Again, you don't need to move data from its archive lo location. Um, and you only pay for the compute then that's needed to do your analysis. So that cost to access, again, as long as there's that kind of in-region access, um, that data uh, access is completely free. There's no moving of the data. You're really just opening it in place. So again, CryoCloud is running in that same region, so there's no cost to access. In terms of cost to compute, however, so, you know, again, you can think of it like your laptop, you have to buy that compute um, if you wanted to upgrade from, um, you know, 100, uh, 125 gigabytes or something up to something much, much larger, a couple terabytes, that's going to cost more money. Um, so you can kind of think of it in terms of this, this world of cloud computing, instead of like an upfront cost, you're paying, you're kind of paying as you go. So CryoCloud is, is paying as you go, as Tasha mentioned, that's why, you know, we're wanting to make sure you log out. Um, if you're not using it, you're going to log, you know, it logs you out automatically. That's because that there's that cost to kind of keep running. And then as far as storage, also, as Tasha mentioned, within CryoCloud, you know, it does cost to store data. Um, with analysis in place, though, again, that's another key benefit is that, you know, you really don't have to actually migrate or sort of move data into a separate um, location as long as you're analyzing in place. However, of course, you might want to be storing um, ancillary data or outputs of your analysis. So again, there is that cost associated with it if you're sort of setting up your own S3 bucket, for example. Okay, um, I'll skip over, kind of skim over this just a little bit, but I think, um, as I've been mentioning, I, I really want to touch on this notion of like when, when to cloud. So, um, you know, even though we're in this migration moving to the cloud, um, it's, not, uh, it's not sort of a mandate that you have to sort of migrate your own analysis workflow over. Um, it's a steep, it can be a steep learning curve. We're trying to make that less steep and really like, um, really appreciate any feedback or those questions that you may have about, um, cloud computing can really feed our own resources and guidance for, for you and others. Um, it can feel overwhelming. Um, so there are times when cloud's effective. 
but times also where the download model may still be more appropriate. So these are, I think, some really great questions to ask yourself in terms of data volume, the time it may take to like download that data, storage, compute power, um, kind of collaboration needs. So all of those, I think, are really good questions to ask yourself. Um, Okay, so that's kind of my really quick introduction to, to the Earth Data Cloud and note that, you know, we, we have other kind of tutorials and, and guidance that takes a full hour in of itself just to walk through this. So I know that was kind of quick and dirty, um, but we'll keep kind of revisiting these concepts as we go through. I'm also going to give a very quick introduction to ISAT2. Um, note that we will be exploring the data in more detail as we move into the tutorials. So um, again, we'll, we'll revisit some of these concepts. But um, again, because we are uh, working on some ISAT2 examples, I wanted to give you a, pre a, a brief introduction to it. Um, so ISAT-2, this was a, a NASA satellite launched in 2018. Um, it carries a, a, a single a LIDAR instrument called ATLAS. And uh, it's, for those of you um, not familiar with LIDAR, it's this active remote sensing technique where pulses of light are um, emitted and that return time from when that pulse kind of hits a, the surface, um, hits a surface and goes back up um, to the instrument is used to measure uh, distance. So it's kind of used as a proxy for distance, in this case, the height of something on the Earth's surface. Um, so this is an overview of all of the data products or data sets that are coming from ISAT-2. It's a cryospheric focused mission, um, but there are many other products that, and we'll actually wor work on one of them as we move into the IcePix tutorial, um, so they range from things like sea ice freeboard to land elevation, cloud backscatter characteristics. So this is a, a kind of um, mapping of all of those products sort of from the raw data to, um, to those higher level, uh, more aggregated um, derived products. Other key features, and really like I think my take home of all this is that ISAT-2 is a really high resolution. It's it's a really incredible, um, the mission itself and the instrument, it's really incredible. So um, again, it's this photon counting LIDAR, but again, take home, high resolution, 10,000 laser pulses are released per second. Um, I'll walk through kind of how the structure of that, uh, of how those, um, how, basically how those laser pulses are split into, into beam pairs. Um, I'll show you a diagram of that in a minute. But basically, we get measurements taken every 70 centimeters along the satellite's ground track, which is really incredible. Um, again, skimming over this a little bit because I want to jump into to, uh, uh, the other tutorials here. Um, but this, this diagram, I think, is a, is a really nice overview of how, so it's from that single laser, um, that laser gets split into three beam pairs. So, um, and actually I'll scroll up a little bit. So there's these three strong and weak beam pairs, and um, you'll see these designations as we get into the files. So GT, like GT1L, GT1R, so that's ground track one left, ground track one right. Um, so all of the data, um, and you'll see the structure of the files are you get you get points basically back um, that are aligned to each of those six beams. So really quick overview, but we'll dive into a little bit of this uh, in a little more detail in the future. Um, also skip over counting photons. I think uh, again this is just reference material, but just note again since the lidar uh, is collecting at the single photon level. Um, which is pretty incredible. So you get a lot of data, the lower level products, you get an incredible amount of data because you're essentially getting a height value at, um, for each of those photon returns. Um, so there's a lot of algorithms that, uh, there's algorithms that process um, sort of the unwanted photons that kind of uh, add to some of the noise and that produces some of those higher level products. So really quick overview of all that. And I'll end here with just sort of navigating the tool and access options um, across, in particular, ISAT2. But I think one thing to note overall across all of NASA's Earth data, um, there are a lot of search access visualization and customization tools. Um, so there's some uh, guidance. Natasha quickly mentioned um, we are building a NASA Earth Data Cloud Cookbook. So this Tools and Services Roadmap link takes you to that, um, one of the cheat sheets there that kind of provides a little bit of overview of sort of how to navigate all of these options. 
particularly for ISAT 2, we're going to highlight just a few tool and access options today. And you'll see this even further on beyond this hour. Um, others will be showing a, a great overview of Slide Rule Earth. Um, there are other web user, use, uh, uh, web interfaces, including NASA Earth Data Search, to search and, and access all NASA Earth data. Um, but this provides just kind of an, a little bit of an overview of the capabilities. And I, I'd say these are really complementary. And we'll touch on kind of the, the complementary capabilities, particularly within IcePix and Earth Access in a minute. But things like uh, filtering spatially um, with different input uh, areas, filtering by time and date, previewing the data, downloading and accessing cloud hosted. Um, so this gives you some idea of kind of those capabilities across all of these. But again, that's just, just a snapshot. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to kind of skip straight into the Jupyter notebooks. Um, another thing, another, uh, I'm actually going to go back up here. So this kind of second um, tutorial, which is also not uh, not code based, but more of an overview. I'll just kind of show you what, what's in here. And again, um, you can use this kind of more for reference. Um, and I'll try to just do maybe a really quick overview of NASA Earth Data Search. Um, so, but yeah, this, this overview just gives you a nice guide to how to search across NASA Earth Data using, using this website um, and how to basically find whether data are in the cloud right now um, and getting uh, those S3 links, so those locations to those S3 buckets in the cloud, um, if you are interested in those. Um, and I'll do this, I'll do this in like two minutes. It'll be really quick. Um, I'll throw this uh, URL into chat, which is search.earthdata.nasa.gov. Um, but I know sometimes it's you know nice to give a little bit of a visual kind of web-based exploration before we jump into the code. Um, so one thing that's really nice from the, the main um, URL here, I'll just collapse this. There are um, f ways to filter data sets. So you can search on any sort of keyword. You could search up at the top here. Um, I'll throw an NSIDC um, at the top. And then you can filter under filter collections. You can click this available in Earth Data Cloud. Um, so that's a really nice way um, if you are particularly interested in the data, since again, we're sort of in this migration um, sort of phase right now where not everything is available. Um, so here I get 106 matching collections. Um, and if I'm, you know, I'm just going to click on one particular, this global geolocated photon data. So this is that lower level high resolution data um, where you can um, yeah, so we're not going to go into that today, um, that particular data set today, um, but that's one of our, um, one of the products that a lot of the higher level kind of uh, surface specific products are derived from. I can go ahead and like add one granule, one file to, um, to kind of my order. I can click on this download green button at the bottom. And really what I just wanted to go ahead and show here. Um, if I click this direct download option and then again click download data, um, this is where you can get information on the data access links and using Earth Data Search. So um, there's information. This can just take you to the link to download the file itself, but there's also this tab to the right that says AWS S3 access, and here's where you can get more information on bucket object prefix. You don't actually have to know any of this information um, as we move into the Earth Data or the Earth Access Library, which sort of abstracts all of this for you. Um, so we'll touch on that in a moment. But here's where you get this S3 URL. So you can copy this, you can save. If you have a long list of links, you can kind of save that as a text file. And then you can move that into um, CryoCloud, for example, if you want to reference um, all of those uh, S3 links uh, for later. So this is just, again, a super quick overview of Earth Data Search, but it's a really great tool if you want to explore kind of the data that um, it exists across NASA Earth Data. But we will be utilizing the same kind of search capabilities um, programmatically using um, these Earth Access and IcePix libraries. So let's now go ahead and jump in to, um, to the notebooks themselves. So uh, 
I am, yeah, so go ahead and switch into your cryo cloud tab if you have that open. And actually, let me just pause here. I wanted to make sure um, and just ask if anyone has any questions about that, that portion. Otherwise, go ahead and start kind of navigating um, to the cryo cloud website repository that you have just cloned. And actually, I don't know if it's um, maybe a little easier to see. You can change in settings. There's a theme if you want to do like dark mode versus light mode. I'll maybe switch back to light um, if that's a little easier to see. So in my file um, directory structure here, I'm in the CryoCloud website folder. And you can, um, I would go ahead and open that up so you can kind of see the, uh, the structure of the repository where everything kind of lives. Um, and actually, before I do that, something I should have asked right away, um, one thing that you will need as a prerequisite for data access to NASA Earth Data is an Earth Data login account. Um, so has anyone, does, is that not familiar to anyone or are you unsure if you have a NASA Earth Data login account? Use your hand and I will, um, we'll get you all set up. Okay, so does everyone like have an account and know your password? Yeah, and raise your hand or go off mute or put in the chat online if um, if you if this is not sounding familiar to you and you need an Earth Data login account, we can get you set up. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Thank you. And I will, um, I'll collapse the folder as well once we get into the notebook, yeah. Okay. Great, so <laughs> that's like the one um, important prerequisite for, for accessing NASA Earth Data. Okay, great. And just don't keep hollering if you have any questions or issues. So we're gonna go ahead and um, within the CryoCloud website folder, we're gonna open up the, you can double click on the book folder and then scroll down to tutorials. It should be the last folder um, in your tutorials. And then one more, folder. Um, go ahead and open up. It's NASA Earth Data Cloud. I can expand this a little bit. NASA Earth Data Cloud Access. So what I just showed in the book itself, um, you can see where now all of those files exist that are rendered um, in the book. So I walked through one and two, and we're going to go ahead now and open up number three, which is the earthaccess.ipynb. So you can double click on that. That's the Jupyter Notebook extension. And in the meantime, I'm gonna collapse this and just give you one minute to navigate to that. Once you're in this notebook, um, since everything has been rendered already so that it shows up in the book website itself, we're gonna go ahead and clear all of those cells so we can run this in real time. So go ahead and go into kernel it's that, um, it's the top level menu under kernel, and then go ahead and click restart kernel and clear all outputs. So it'll just sort of refresh everything. Um, it'll ask you, it'll kind of warning will pop up. Do you want to restart? All variables will be lost. That's okay. Go ahead and click restart. If you don't do that, it's, um, it's, it's okay, but it's nice to kind of have that clean slate so that we can run the code and you can kind of see it again in live. Okay. So let's jump into a little bit of overview on Earth Access. So this notebook is demonstrating how to search, access, work with cloud-hosted NASA data using this Earth Access package and doing so in Python. Um, so we've already given a lot of background into where the data are stored and these S3 buckets. We've talked about direct access, this idea of opening the files as they um, like in place without moving them. Um, so this Earth Access package, this was developed by Luis Lopez, who's in the back, um, uh, so he can answer all questions about the library itself. Um, and this allows easy search of um, what's called CMR, this common metadata repository. So all the data that live in um, NASA Earth data um, are cataloged in this very robust, very large metadata repository. So we're leveraging that behind the scenes um, to download data. And it can also be used to access both the sort of the data that's hosted at the DAC and also cloud-hosted data. 
Um, so, and it kind of deals with all the sort of authentication behind the scenes. So one thing to note is that there are additional, if I go back over to this download status page, something I skimmed over, um, there are additional S3 credentials that are needed to access the data in the cloud from NASA Earth data. Those credentials expire every hour. Earth Access makes that super easy. And it's like, I feel like I don't even have to <laughs> go over that anymore because with Earth Access, you don't even really have to know about that. Um, as an example, we're going to use one of the ISAT2 data sets, the land ice height data sets, over the Juneau ice field Alaska, uh, in Alaska for March and April 2020. These data sets are stored in HDF5, so, and we'll dig in more in other tutorials later on today on that, um, th that data format and, and um, uh, more performant access of that data. Um, so this is kind of the output that we'll produce of those heights. So skipping, skipping, prerequisites being in the cloud and Earth Data Login account. Again, um, make sure you have that and your password handy. Um, I'll skip over NetRC as well because you actually don't need that um, in particular today, but you can set that up, um, which is handy. But I'm gonna skip over it in the interest of time because I know I'm getting a little short here on time. Um, there's a couple of packages. We don't need a lot here. We're gonna install or um, import Earth Access, not install, it's already installed in the image. Um, import Earth Access, we're going to import X-Array and HV Plot. Um, a little bit of background on X-Array, I think we'll utilize it more in other tutorials today. It's a really powerful library if you're not familiar with it for working with multi-dimensional data. Um, so it leverages a couple of other really great powerful libraries behind the scenes, NumPy, Pandas, Matplotlib, Dask, um, and it really makes working with multi-dimensional data, which ISAT2 is in, it's this very like nested hierarchical data structure. It makes it really efficient. Um, so let's go ahead and run our first code cell. And, and I think you're all familiar with running Jupyter Notebooks. You can either click the play button here um, or shift enter. So we'll go ahead and do our imports. And now we'll go ahead and authenticate. So this is where you'll need that um, username and password. And it's as simple as just this one line. So we're gonna kind of create an object, this auth object, and it's just earth data access dot login. So it should prompt you unless you've already set up an NetRC behind the scenes. Again, I'm gonna skip over that for today, just in the interest of time since you don't need that. Um, but if you are interested in creating this file where you won't, so, so basically in the future, you won't have to manually enter your username and password, you can add this persist equals true, and it'll create a file basically that again, like kind of lives in your cryo cloud environment where you won't have to do this again. Um, but just for simplicity, um, it will prompt for today and just do the login. So go ahead and enter your username and password, and then you'll enter your password. And it will tell you if you are uh, good to go and authenticate it. Or actually, if, if nothing, if there, you don't get an error, then you're good to go here. But sometimes, so like raise your hand if you have an error get stuck here, because sometimes it could just be that you're not entering your correct password. Um, but we can help you if that's you get some issue here. Okay, we're going to go ahead now and search for ISAT two collections. Um, Again, I'm going to go fairly quickly. I want to make sure we have time for our ice picks tutorial. Um, we're going to set up a query object. So using now this earth access dot search data sets, you can search on a keyword. So we'll use this example. I just, let's say I want to look for all data sets that match this ice set two keyword. So we'll go ahead and hit enter and 89 data sets have been found. So a lot kind of hit that keyword. You can also search um, for, if you know the data set kind of key or like short name, or you can also search for DOI here. Um, and again, I'm gonna skip over this a little bit because I wanna get to the, the fun actual <laughs> accessing the data files themselves. But this next line, we're essentially just saying, okay, let's grab the first 10 of those in the collection query. And we wanna print um, a summary um, of that information. So we can just basically get some high level information about that data set. So there's this sort of code, this concept ID that's kind of metadata repository speak for a unique ID for that data set. We have file type information. 
um, links to get data, um, a short name. So these codes that I mentioned before, like ATL03 and the version, and then all of that other cloud info that I covered uh, that you saw in the NASA, or excuse me, the Earth, Earth Data Search example. Um, I'm going to go ahead and collapse this. Um, this is a really nice handy trick. If you hover your mouse over the blue bar, if you get a really long output, you can just click that and it'll collapse the output down. Okay, so I'm going to skip over all of that. Well, I just covered it, but that's all the info you get from the um, collection query. Um, a little bit of um, a nice note here, just on a little bit of some background on Python and how data are represented by objects. So this is another, like, I think great kind of Python resource that I'm going to keep going. I'm going to scroll through in the interest of time here, um, but feel free to read through that if you're interested in um, a little bit more background on kind of Python object structure. Um, so I mentioned the short names, the sort of codes. And now let's say we just want to search for cloud hosted data. So if you only want to search for data in the cloud, um, that same query, you can just add cloud hosted equals true. And then you'll just get the data sets that are cloud hosted. So now we're, we have 40. Um, for the most part, for, for NSIDC in particular, we're basically have that same copy of the data, both on like hosted on, on premises at the DAC and also hosted on AWS. So that's kind of why, give or take, we about at, that we have about half of those data sets. We have a couple of extras. Um, I think those are just different versions. Um, and now we're gonna search, we're gonna get into our area of interest and our, our time of interest. So like we mentioned, our, we're interested in the Juno ice field. Um, now what we can do in this next code block is, all right, so let's say we found our data set of interest, this ATL06 short name, which we got from our collection results. We want the data hosted in the cloud we could enter a bounding box here. So if we know that bounding box, um, we can enter, um, so that's uh, south, west, east, north coordinates in decimal degrees, um, put in our temporal range. And in this example, we're just gonna say, okay, we want the first 100. Um, you don't really need that count equals 100. It's a nice way just if you're exploring and don't want a ton of results back. But here we only found five, four granules or four files. So we get that, uh, back in our results. And now we can set up this um, display uh, for R in results. So we're kind of setting up um, this rendered metadata that shows information now about, um, about all of the files themselves. And if you see those little, those three dots, um, looks like that collapsed my output automatically. So you can, I don't know if you saw that, but if you see these three dots here, you can click that bar again and it'll expand it. So you can see the files, the sizes, this little preview from these browse images um, that are also archived. And now we're getting into the fun stuff. So now we're gonna directly access that data instead of downloading it. It's kind of a two-step process to go to get data from an S3 bucket. So we're gonna use the earth access open method and that's gonna create first this object that's then used to load data in the second step. So this is where behind the scenes, there is this additional authentication, but you don't have to worry about that using Earth Access because it's going to deal with all those credentials kind of behind the scenes. There's a really great note here that I'm also going to skip over in the interest of time, but it gives a little bit more information on kind of that two-step process um, and a little bit of background too on kind of some of the performance um, considerations with, um, with this HDF5 data in the cloud. We might cover that in more detail later on today. So now what we're going to do, we're going to set um, files equal to earthaccess.open. We're going to open those results, those four files that we got back. And then we're going to take um, those files and open them in an X-ray data set. So we'll just, and actually in this example, we're just taking, looks like the, um, the second file, since you can start with zero in Python, that second file in the list of four and we're also going to specify a group. We'll talk about the group structure um, in just a moment, but we're going to open up one of those beams that I mentioned in the introduction, um, one of those group beams and opening up our land ice segments. So this gets us to the heights, um, those land ice heights that are in these segments, um, aggregated segments of um, photon returns. Um, and this will take just a moment to open up. We can just enter DS, which is our X-ray data set, and we can now actually see that data. So again, 
we never moved the data. We were not downloading it. We were directly opening it um, since we're in the cloud in that same region. So we get some information on coordinates, delta time, lat long, and then um, some of the variables that are in this hierarchical group of data. So some quality, h underscore li, that will give you the um, land ice heights and other information. Um, you can get more information in the attributes there. And then our final uh, tada is we're just going to create a really simple scatter plot using the built-in uh, XRA HV plot method. Um, so we're going to say for data set, we just want that h underscore li, that height, that land ice height. We're going to create a uh, scatter plot and just creating a size of those points, size equals two. And that is the plot that we showed at the very top of what we were going to get to today. So you can see those heights um, along that area of interest, that bounding box um, across longitude. So we're going to now jump straight into our final notebook um, for this Earth uh, data access intro. Um, and we'll jump into ice picks. But any um, questions. Well, it was pretty quick. Any questions overall about earth access or issues? In the meantime, you can go ahead and open up. Um, so we go back to your directory structure, open up uh, your fourth and final notebook here, icepix.ipynb. Yeah. This is really good. Yeah, it's a great question. So for those online, the question was, you know, it seemed like you kind of had to have some like insider knowledge, if you will, to specify. I'll go back to the line here. When we opened the data set, um, we had to specify that group. So and we'll actually show this in the second notebook that shows that kind of hierarchical structure of the files in a little bit more detail. But yeah, there's sort of these this nested group structure in these HDF5 files. Um, X-ray today, um, you do have to specify a high-level group. You can't kind of open up the entire file if it's if it's in that structure. But I know we're working to. Um, there's another library out there called Data Tree that does do this. Um, and I, I think there's work in, in place right now to integrate that into the main X-ray library so you won't have to specify the group. Um, but there's ways to figure out that structure. There's information like on NSIDC's website to look at kind of the structure of the data set. And then also with IcePix that we'll look at right now, you can also view all of the variables of the file. So that could also help you understand kind of what all exists in this file. And then that could help you figure out like what to actually plug into X-Ray. It's a great question. Okay, so if you have IcePix opened, go ahead and do the same thing um, in terms of clearing your kernel uh, or clearing all the outputs. So under kernel, restart kernel and clear. What's the scope of the kernels? Are they per notebook that's open? Like you're not going to lose your variables in your other notebook when you do that? Yeah, it does not. Thank you, Tasha. It does not clear any of the other kernels. So it is notebook specific. Thank you. That's a really great question. Yeah. Yeah, good question. OK. So we're going to now jump into another Python library um, <clears throat> called IcePix. So we're going to do kind of similar functions, but with some really awesome value-added capabilities specifically for ISAT2. So we'll search, access, analyze, and plot a cloud-hosted ISAT2 data set. Um, a little bit of background on IcePix. So it's it's a software library. It's also a community. Jessica, uh, Jessica Scheich, who's on the Zoom right now, um, she is the founder and main developer of IcePix. Um, so if you have questions for her, she can jump in. Um, and this was really kind of born out of an ISAT2 hack week a couple of years ago where we, were, where we were working on data access and didn't, at the time, didn't have something like Earth Access. And it was complex in terms of programmatically accessing the data. Um, so this community was built that was um, community-driven across ISAT2 um, 
researchers to build and develop this library specifically for ISTAT2. And it's really evolved and grown. There's more data sets that are um, available now. And it's really aimed to facilitate this collaborative development around ISAT2 data products, including training, skill building, support, um, really fantastic. So there's many features here. You can search for files, you can order and download. The other key thing is that there are subsetting capabilities um, that NSIDC provides to actually clip the data over that area. Um, so with Earth Access in that example, we just searched for all the data that kind of overlapped that area, but it didn't actually crop it. Um, so you can order that subset. And then also, as um, as was just asked, you can look at all of the data variables, which is also really handy since many of these files have like hundreds of uh, variables, which is which is a lot. And then also reading that ISAT2 data really nicely into X-Array. Um, so there's this relationship with Earth Access. IcePix now utilizes Earth Access to do that authentication, which is really great. Um, and again, for that S3 token uh, credential access as well. So we're actually going to be looking at the ATL08, the land and vegetation height product for this tutorial. And we will jump right in. Similar kind of prerequisites, Earth Data Login, um, this hub, um, all that good stuff. So we'll go ahead and start the with our first code block. Code block is importing IcePix as IPX. And then, um, so this will actually import our IcePix library. And then, um, again, not a lot of other imports that we need here. We're going to import um, a library that um, can, can work with JSON files, um, math, uh, the warning setup um, to, to suppress warnings later on. You'll see um, we're going to import NumPy, matplotlib, and Shapely, which um, is a really nice library for working with geometries. And then we'll also... Um, just set up our matplotlib um, inline so uh, to kind of have our, our plotting outputs nice and clean. So in this example, we are going to um, work with a GeoJSON of our area of interest. And actually, this is awesome, Tasha. I just learned today how nice it is to work with GeoJSONs in the cloud itself. So actually, in our folder, um, we have this GeoJSON file. And if I open this with um, with GeoJSON. This is so cool. So you can see um, what we're working with here. It's um, this large um, protected forest outside of Guadalajara in Mexico. So going back over to the notebook, um, we're going to open that file um, using that Shapely um, package. And if you just print out that object, you can also see it's the same outline, um, not geolocated. We can also do some some fun plotting um, of that shape file, but not for today. Um, so we get that kind of imported into or created as an object into our Python notebook. And then we're going to use some search parameters to set up a search query. So really similar to what we did with, um, with Earth Access. We know our short name, name of interest is HL08. That's our short kind of code for the land um, and vegetation product of ISAT2. We'll specify that spatial extent. And then in this case, we're just interested in a single day, um, May 4th, 2019. And then we'll take all of those kind of search parameters and put them into this IPX, icepix.query um, uh, object with our short name, spatial extent, and date range. So region will now be kind of what we'll use to interact with that search, those search outputs. So now we're going to display um, if any of those files matched our search. So region dot avail for available underscore granules. Um, and we'll set IDs equals true, just that gives us the file name itself um, to see if anything matched. So we do get one file name back. Um, we can also see, just like we did with Earth Access to set cloud equals true, we can also get the, um, if we set cloud equals true, we'll get the S3 URL back in our results, which is really handy. And in this case, we're going to show you the download method here. So we're going to go ahead and um, select region, type in region.downloadgranules. Um, and we're going to specify a new folder to, so in our current directory, that's what that dot 
um, specifies here, we're going to create um, this new folder with our output. So now because we're doing download, we're going to have to do the same thing and enter our Earth Data login username. If you did that persist equals true earlier in Earth Access, um, don't believe you'd have to do this line because it would already find your username and password through that NetRC file. But I'll go ahead and re-enter my Earth Data login information here. And so now what's happening is we're submitting this data order to NSIDC. Um, so we get an order ID back. So like I mentioned earlier, there's um, kind of what's happening behind the scenes here is it's automatically applying that area of interest, that shapefile, GeoJSON, um, around that forested region. It's going to actually crop the data. So that's why it's sort of doing this processing. So it's actually going to take um, sort of a clipped output and provide that back. Um, and put it then in the new folder that we, we created. So if I go back up to folder, I'm sorry, I don't think I mentioned this earlier, but if you just click um, on the folder button here, it'll like open or collapse, which I find really handy, especially if I'm just working from my, from my little laptop screen. Um, so if I open that up, you can now see that we have a new folder created here. And now what we have, if I make this a little bigger, we have this new file that is, um, uh, has pro processed um, uh, added to the file name. So we can see that it's this processed output from NSIDC. Okay. And yeah, other tips for if you don't have to, if we're not doing this, um, or, you know, submitting your data login every time. Um, you can also, there's other ways that you can kind of set this up. You can create environment variables. And if you're interested, we can um, give you some more guidance on that. Or again, setting up a NetRC. So just wanted to do it with this manual example today, since that's probably what you will be seeing. So now we're gonna go ahead and read that file with ice picks. So there's a few steps here. We're gonna first create a read object. So this sort of sets up a connection to your file, validates the metadata. And then now this is where we can get into really digging into the structure of the file and looking at the variables that we want to read. So first we'll create this read object and um, what we're first doing in this first line, we're setting up this pattern. So if you saw, I'll open this up again, um, like this file name, um, it's really long, um, like ATL await underscore, like there's a lot of numbers and structure here to this file. Um, and you can find more information um, on the file naming convention on NSIDC's documentation. But we're setting up this pattern so that we're, um, so that we can better um, kind of utilize that information as we dig into the file further. So we have like the product, which is two values. We have this date and then it's underscore with a date time. Then the next four values here is our reference ground track. So um, we're just setting that up so that we can submit that into our reader. So now um, if I hit go on that, we have one file matching the file name pattern to be read in. Um, and if you just, you know, just so you can kind of see if you type in reader, now we can see that we have this sort of object that will again, interact with in the next, uh, in the next few code blocks. So here is where we can now view the variables. So this is really handy with ice picks. So um, if we type reader.vars.avail for available, now we can view all those variables contained in your data set. So, um, this collapsed by default, but if I if I expand this, you are going to see a ton of files, and this is where you can see that group structure of the data. So there's a top level ancillary data. There's going to be a lot of scrolling right now. This top level ancillary data um, group, some high level data sets, um, geo segments, surface type, and then you'll start seeing all of those six the you know the three beam pairs, the high low um, strength beam pairs you'll start to see all of those kind of nested variables and all of those six ground track groups. So it's a lot. I will stop scrolling so that <laughs> you won't get too dizzy here and I'll collapse that. You can see that it's a lot of variables. Um, and this is great. I mean, these are robust, really rich data sets with a lot of variables to analyze and dig into, um, but that can be a lot to, to wade through. So a really nice feature of IcePix is that you can browse those variables. Again, there's hundreds in this case. Um, but what we can do is first just kind of understand the organization of those variables. Um, 
And there's some, some background here on, again, I mentioned it earlier on, um, but there's a few important pieces of, of the algorithm that kind of go into creating this higher level product from the photon um, data that we get from the lower level. So this is some background on this product. Um, and this is really, I think, similar kind of algorithms are applied to the other surface specific data sets. So land ice, um, height, sea ice, um, there's ocean data sets. Um, and cloud um, backscatter as well. So creating these higher level variables, um, this algorithm like identifies signal photons. It's doing some classification of to find either terrain or canopy or canopy top. Um, it removes that elevation. So the heights are with respect to the ground. And then it's going to group and kind of bin those photons into 100 meter segments. So it's just to, um, yeah, it's it's basically doing that binning so that you, you're you left with, for each of those 100 meter segments, one value, one height value. Um, and here's a little bit, this is from um, a paper, paper from Amy Neuenschwander, who's one of the leads on the ATL08 product to kind of show that classification. Um, and then this is a really nice kind of overview of that structure of the ATL08 file. So kind of, as we showed with Earth, the Earth Access example, kind of setting, you know, opening an X-ray, kind of one of those um, groups um, kind of per, you know, kind of per line um, to have to pull those into X-ray. So this gives you a little bit of background on like within each of those six ground tracks, you get these signal photons, land segments, canopy terrain. So a lot of nested hierarchy here. There's more information um, if you're interested on NSIDC's website. And so there's a lot to explore, um, but what we'll do is we'll use a common variable, this H underscore canopy. Um, so this is uh, basically 98% height of all individual relative canopy heights, so height above the terrain. And so what we'll do is, um, back to our reader object, within that variable list, we'll pull out the canopy, latitude, and longitude. So we'll get that um, those points back at, at each of those canopy segment values. Um, and we need that very adding those variables before you can load the data. And now finally, we'll go ahead and load. Um, so uh, one just kind of aside here, um, we're just turning off warnings. There's there was an X array warning that's resolved in the coming release of IcePix. It's just not um, not quite ready yet, and that will get integrated into the CryoCloud image. So um, we're just kind of suppressing that for now, but you don't have to worry about any of that. Um, but what we're doing here, so DS, so our data set, um, now we'll just use that same reader object, reader.load, and we'll load that in. So in that single line, this is also really, um, really powerful. We didn't have to do anything um, fancy here with opening that in X-Ray, that load um, method is utilizing X-Ray behind the scenes to cr now create that X-Ray data set. So now we have, um, you can see some coordinate information, those data variables um, with lat long and um, canopy. And again, now we have our data set and we can do a similar thing like we did with uh, Earth Access. We can just use the built-in functionality of X-Ray to specify a scatter plot. So um, before we use HVPlot, it's a little bit more of like an interactive style of plotting, um, but this dot plot dot scatter is also really handy and it's again built, kind of built into X-Ray. So we'll specify X is our longitude variable, Y is latitude, um, and then we'll set up our um, uh, canopy value to create kind of that um, color mapping of canopy height. So here's what we get. I'll make it just a little smaller so you can see it in one screen, almost one screen. Um, so we have our latitude and longitude. So we're kind of essentially creating a map, if you will, um, sort of a geolocated plot. Um, and we can see that there's that track of data across, um, across latitude and longitude. And you can see the kind of the height values um, that are kind of color coded here. Um, so another note, that data is just for our area of interest. So that's because of IcePix subsetting feature that just sort of happens out of the box, which is great. Um, I think I'm about out of time, but a couple of just notes um, on, on kind of when to cloud. So you'll notice we downloaded a granule to read in rather than directly reading it from an S3 bucket. Um, and we'll, I think we'll get into this maybe in other tutorials. Um, 
reading in that single group, if you recall from Earth Access, it took a little bit more time um, and did not include multiple groups. So due to kind of the way that I said two data stored on disk, there was some background in the note that I skipped over in, Earth, in the Earth Access tutorial, um, it can be slow and there's efforts to kind of address this issue. Um, and IcePix will certainly implement them as soon as they're available. So, you know, working towards storing ice 2 in a cloud optimized format, we'll get into kind of what that means later on today. Um, reading the data using the H5 Coral library, again, they'll be, we'll, we'll dive into what that is um, in a minute, but essentially working towards more performantly re reading these data sets in the cloud. Um, I think I'll leave these example plots here for you to kind of play around with, I think I'm a bit out, um, out of time, but there are a few more examples for reading and visualizing ATL08 data. Um, you can go ahead and run those if you're interested. Um, so you can view those photon classifications and kind of see how the terrain um, versus ground versus canopy height was classified, plotting canopy compared to the ground height. And that's really about it. I'll leave it there and answer any questions you have. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So the question was about, sorry, I will reshare. Yeah. It was about that pattern, um, pattern above. And I don't know, I don't want to put you on the spot, Jessica, but if you want to go off mute, if you have any more like details. So it's basically this question was on this code here. Um, as far as like what we're doing with that pattern to kind of input it into the read. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so, so that was based on, okay, sorry. There was an echo. And so I thought somebody else was talking. Um, yeah. So that was, uh, initially trying to really capitalize on the fact that we kind of have this known file name pattern, and we could use that to get some information out of the data files. Um, as Amy noted, uh, this is actually something that's changing in the most recent or the upcoming release of IcePix as well, um, because it can be very long and confusing and is not is not strictly necessary. Um, so in the the upcoming version, you'll be able to just, you don't need to supply a pattern, you'll just be able to supply a file name um, or list of files. Um, and all of that will be taken care of behind the scenes. So if that doesn't answer your question and you want to know more about that type of file name parsing, I'm I'm happy to talk more about it. But for within IcePix specifically, um, you can you cannot worry about needing to learn more about it. For, for future data access. And I also just want to acknowledge you. So you and your colleagues have, um, built that IceFix notebook. Um, it was fantastic. So I want to you know, give you credit overall for IceFix in general, but thank you so much for all your contributions to that notebook. And if this helps too, this just provides the naming convention. So all of the ISAT2 data sets have that file naming convention, which is a little different can be different across the products, but you can find that on the individual like websites um, of the data sets and the documentation there. So if you have more questions about where that lives, I could point you to it. All right, thanks. All right, I had a few more points that I wanted to, um, to give you guys before we go into break. And I'll show you in just a moment, kind of the schedule for the rest of the day. Um, some of the things to keep in mind when you go through this workshop is we, as, as we start working in the cloud, we're actually going to be using different ways of computing than we have in the, in the past, right? We used to download all of our data that would take time. It would do it manually. Maybe we have to unzip it. Then we read it in, da, da, da. And a lot of the intermediary steps, because they take so long to create, we also keep in store. But now that we can access data and stream it into the cloud, um, and, and you don't have to download and store it. A lot of the in intermediary steps are so quick to produce that you don't 
you shouldn't store these. So a lot of the storage goes away when you start using the cloud. Um, and so we're going to create a notebook here in the very near future that kind of gives you a roadmap for some of these new ways of working. But keep that in mind as you work that you, we have a, a, a scratch bucket where you can store and, and access data very quickly, but it stores it only temporarily. And so I'll, if you do have to download anything, you can delete it immediately. Um, some of these new ways of, of doing this, you can automate just about everything and, and really reduce the amount of storage you use. The other thing I wanted to note um, that can be confusing is while we are working in the cloud and we could stream data in the cloud and accessing data in the cloud can be really nice because you can just grab subsets of data in some places. Like if you're using certain kinds of data, you can just grab pieces of it instead of the entire image, that sort of thing. That's really nice about the cloud. You can still access data from other places like, like HTTPS. There's um, ways of ac accessing FTP. Um, FTP data sets directly into your notebook so you still don't have to download it. So keep that in mind. If it's not in the cloud, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to still download it. You can still access it. 